I think I have been interacting with Anisha. Oh, yes. Hello, ma'am. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. She is the one who has been mailing you, and I am the one who has been WhatsApping you. <laughs> <laughs> Samira and Anisha, two names I can very well recognize. And at the outset, you know, even before we begin formally, I just want to make it clear that I have shared that with Samira. In a bad health situation today, so forgive me if I really go astray here, there, everywhere. No, ma'am, they just very no, grateful that you are joining. Joining today, yes. Honestly, Anisha. In the meantime, could we just do a kind of an understanding about which image to throw up when? Uh, ma'am, I have the images downloaded, yeah. so I'll okay. just I'll I can share my screen. You can let me know yeah. uh, which goes yeah. in what order. I want to begin with that video link of that worldly protest song. Okay, right? yes, I have that. But, okay. uh, but that's a longish one, so we will not play it for five minutes. We'll uh, cut it short because it will take up too much of time. Huh? Right. And uh, then we we'll come to those paintings. In that, I just let you know, you know, because they're two as a pair that I want to show. This whole question of tradition and contemporary energy. Right? No problem. Uh, Ma'am, I have uh, opened it almost like a slideshow. So if you ask me to stick to another image, I can change it. Samira, your voice is cracking. Sorry, Samira, I didn't tell you. Is, is, is my it, voice disrupted? No, no, no. I think it was just mine. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. I think you hear me now. Uh, uh -huh. Yes. yes. Huh, I'm saying that I've opened it almost like a slideshow, and uh, our co team member, Jolyn John, who's also joined, she also has the images as a PPT. So, whichever okay. one you ask us to play uh, to show when, we can show it. All right, all right, no problem. Samir, do you want to check the streaming? Yeah, you can check it now, or if I start with the streaming. Check. I can see Kashish here. She's a known name for me. <laughs> Hi, ma'am. I'm still in college. Hi, I'm trying to get back. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. Good. Good to see you here after such a long time. I know. I know. We just, I mean, I keep hearing about you, but uh, <laughs> the others must be wondering what is this special bonding going on. <laughs> so, uh, Vinita, ma'am, has taught me at IP. <laughs> yeah, so, during my undergrad days. <laughs> I figured. Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready to start, Samira? You want to wait for a while? Uh, Mom, we're just waiting for a couple more students and faculty to join. Actually, our timetable has classes till 11.40. So, oh, sometimes yes. they might just be joining, might yeah, be yeah. winding up their classes. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, streaming is fine. Okay, great. That's great. Okay. So then we are ready. You've said 20 minutes, Samira? Uh, Ma'am, you can push it up to 25 as well. Okay. Not a problem. Let me see. I'll, I'll try and pack it up in 20 minutes. In today's situation, it suits me, actually. <laughs> Whatever you prefer, ma'am. No problem. <laughs> So how was your uh, session yesterday? I couldn't join. It started yesterday, isn't it? The lecture yes. series? Yes, yes. Um, It was really good. Uh, we were uh, since the theme of the first session was modernity and society. So we had uh, Dr. Tobias Stone, who is uh, teaching physics. So he basically gave us uh, an introduction to the idea of modernity related to the scientific revolution by starting with Aristotelian. Uh, 
science, Aristotelian poetics, and leading up to, say, modern medieval, medieval Europe, modern Europe, the Renaissance, so on and so forth. Uh, right. And uh, Dr. Uh, Asiti Datta sort of spoke about the idea of waste, uh, mm-hmm. relating it to class, to capitalism, uh, to caste, religion, and, uh, you know, how we tend to view it, particularly even more relevant in the pandemic today, the idea of miasma mm-hmm. and disease that we often tend to associate with waste. So he briefly gave examples from even literary text, uh, documentary of uh, another uh, short film so, to talk about how we is represented. Okay. So against that backdrop, let me tell you that today's, at least my lecture, is going to be rather simplistic. Um, we're just going to deal with, you know, what you see on the screen and a kind of analysis. And um, I'd like to go into, you know, a little bit of comments about um, orality. And, um, of course, uh, talking about uh, contemporary. That's why I've chosen paintings, you know, which have been done by the same artist at two different stages of life. And I'll deal with it. That's absolutely fine. I think uh, we can begin, Anisha. I think we should begin. And uh, students can keep joining in as and when. Uh, right? Uh, Jennifer, is it okay if we just start now? Yes, absolutely. Right? Okay. Oh, great. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, Jennifer. It's Hello. really nice to have both the speakers. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll begin then. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of ELA's lecture series. The theme for today is the contemporary in culture, and we're extremely delighted and privileged to have Dr. Vinita Sinha and Ms. Shabani Hasanwalia with us who would be en- engaging with uh, different aspects of this topic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, without any further ado, let's start the session. I would now like to invite our ELA core team member, Ria, to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Vinita Sinha. Ria? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Today, we welcome with us Dr. Vinita Sinha. Dr. Vinita Sinha is an Associate Professor of English at Indipris College for Women, University of Delhi. She is an author, researcher, and translator. Her areas of interest include translation studies, oral histories, and comparative literature. She is the coordinator of the Museum and Archives Learning Resource Center and the Translation and Translation Studies Center at her college. She is the faculty advisor for the annual Students' Transitional Journal, CODE, in her college. She has presented and published her research on Madhubani art and artists at national and international levels. Her recent publications in English translation of the contemporary Hindi poet, Sahitya Academy Award winner, Anamika's Poetry. Her forthcoming works include a study of intercultural proximities in folk tales or cultural interpretation. In collaborative effort with the French novelist, Martine Lecoz, her research-based study on subverse voices on subversive voices in oral tradition of North Bihar is also under progress. The Vaishali Corridor, a book on poetry translation, is due next month. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. And thanks to everyone. Um, I have been in communication with, as I said a while ago, with Samira and Anisha. And I must say, you carried it out very smoothly, very promptly. In fact, I was the one who was always delaying with the information. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, now that we are here together and uh, the topic, as you have defined, you, uh, you'd like to hear about culture and contemporaneity. Um, you know, the first thing that came to my mind when I was planning this lecture was to show you a video, which is about worldly art. And it was actually car- carried out as a protest song. So in a while, I'll ask... Uh, uh, Samira to play that. Um, it's a long one, Samira, so you, you may cut it short if you like uh, or just skip in between. But I'd like you to look at a couple of things, you know, that um, what is this a worldly art? We all know about worldly art as an art form that thrives and survives. But the manner in which it has been used over here for a purpose, that is what leaves us to, uh, you know, it's a question to ponder about that um, where does the oral tradition survive? Does it survive in its own domain or does it necessarily need to be documented and brought in the printed form? 
this was a dilemma that I was facing when I was carrying out my research in uh, the Madhubani region. I was working with the artists over there. Basically, my objective was to to study uh, the voices of subversion in oral traditions, uh, speak, you know, especially focusing on folk tales and uh, folk songs. But in the process, I came across a number of artists, both men and women. And that's where I got engaged in a different question altogether, that how a traditional art form, <clears throat> something which belongs to every household. In fact, there are villages which... Uh, survive only on the basis of art, by selling art. So it is something which is culturally uh, there in their domain. Every woman would know, I'm emphasizing every woman would know um, how to paint the walls because this art actually started off as floor art, something quite similar to Aipan or Alpana as we say in Bengal and um, Aipan I think in Chhattisgarh or somewhere. Um, then gradually it moved to, and that was of course guided a lot by uh, the tantric philosophy. Then gradually it went up to the walls, and when it came to the walls, it became some, became more of an adornment. And they started they would paint, you know, scenes from mythology, whether it is Ramayana or Mahabharat, not Mahabharat, Ramayana largely, and Krishna Leela. Yes, that's what I have seen very often. And then gradually. Uh, since, you know, since they became very adept at it or they were adept at it, they started using it for commercial purposes. And it all started at the time of Popul Jaikar, who took this initiative. And women started painting on canvas, on paper, which was sold and extremely rewarding for them. So that apart, the culture was kept alive um, by doing it. Of course, that it, uh, it became uh, commercial to a great extent. And as I said, there is... There are villages which, um, which have, uh, you know, art as their basis of survival. Every household has an artist painting um, uh, day and night or, uh, you know, all for a commercial purpose. But uh, what I noticed was that culture aside, many of these practitioners of art had started using it for, uh, for self-expression. When I say self-expression, I mean, you know, uh, autobiographical art uh, or even biographical art, because I know of an artist who decided to paint the other one's life. And of course, this was a very rare instance, but the two, where the two of them belonged to two different art traditions, one a Patichitra artist and the other a Mithila painting. Uh, when they met, there was no connect in terms of language because one was Bengali speaking, Bangla speaking, the other was speaking um, Hindi. One was um, educated, the other one was illiterate, absolutely. And yet that connect between the two was really uh, something which was astounding for me because I was there, present. And at the end of it, they picked up each other's lives, you know, instances from each other's life to paint on the paper. And a lot of, you know, a, a very skillful moderation is done. For example, I don't have that painting with you, but I'll just try and outline the concept that when A paints the life of B, which is, uh, you know, which is full of trials and tribulations and poverty stricken, uh, dislocation, uh, when the Midnapur floods took place, the whole family had to leave home. The, there was no home, actually, it all collapsed and they moved to some other place. But when the artist was painting this particular scene, I noticed that she had taken care to make the waters, to keep the waters really blue and sparkling with a lot of fish uh, swimming in the waters. And uh, the family, which was on the boat, the father got left behind and the family of six or seven children was put on the boat and they went off. So it was a moment of separation. And yet in the painting, I found that the faces did not show any kind of anguish. A little bit of surprise, yes, but otherwise quite all right. So I asked her, I asked this artist as to why did she paint it so differently, whereas it was an occasion of trauma and separation. Uh, the answer was that I would not like to paint the darker side of life, be it of anyone. So I have to invest a lot of strength and energy to the pictures that I wish to bring forth. And uh, when I'm painting my sahakalakar, that's the word, the fellow artist, 
I would not like to um, show those things, you know, which uh, put her somewhere at the back foot or somewhere, you know, make her defensive about her own life. So poverty, for example, uh, when the household is being painted, although they were poverty stricken, she does not show. She doesn't show opulence, but she doesn't show poverty either. She just shows them as Spartan, but well clad, completely clad. Anyway, that apart. Uh, when I talk about autobiographical art, these women, you know, they have started using this traditional art form to give expression to their personal lives, suppressed desires, many occasions of discrimination and denial, which emerge in the paintings that they do. So this was that blend of culture and contemporaneity, as I saw, because the painting was being done by adhering to the norms of this traditional art form, where you must draw a border, you must use certain colors, you must paint the figures in a particular manner, you know, you don't normally show nude figures, etc. Uh, some of them have done that also, but generally speaking. And uh, yet, the thought behind it was something which was extremely personal, which is so subtly conveyed that for an outsider, for a normal you know, person to watch, to look at it, uh, would be hard to understand. But when you interact with the artist, you're able to figure out. So we'll go through those pieces. But can we just begin with the Worldly Protest song, uh, the video link, Samira? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. I'm just sharing my screen. You can yes. just please let me know. Yeah, ban karo. Uh, I'm just trying to share a video which will allow for the. Shall I try? Uh, no. Now I have to play. Uh, it was not showing in the. Is my screen. It will be black, but is it visible? It's black so, right now. But is it visible? Uh, it's, yeah, your screen okay. is visible. It's just blank right now. Yeah. I'll.
उद्योगी सरकार में रहे बसा अभी बता के ये बना रहे पैसा और बसा रहे बल्कि सोच भविष्य में इनके बच्चे देखे इन्हें दोष पर अफसोस बना दिख सकेंगे वो सैकड़े हुए अपने अगली पीढ़ी को खुद तुम जियो और जीने दो लगाओ पौधे जब तक छीप दो मूर्खो उठो अपनी सोच बदलो या ना कुछ बचेगा फिर खोने को जीने को एक है प्राण उसकी भी कागज में दुर्मा को पहचान आदिवासी हूँ गरीब इंसान कैसे साबित करूँ मेरा है स्थान मैं किसान मेरे परिवार समान Mom, is that enough? Do you want me to continue playing it? Mom, you are on mute. Sorry. That's okay. I think um, people would have seen it to get an idea. And the basic things that I wanted to highlight in uh, this protest song was. of course worldly art is something that you would be familiar with uh, belongs to maharashtra and this to me my mind appears as a very uh, as an outstanding example of what you call tradition and contemporaneity in the sense that this is an art form uh, which has been uh, put into multimodal translation and the painting is invested the painting as you saw it is invested with movement uh, or with motion a uh, fair deal of aggression if you were re reading the uh, titles over there as it was reading the the song the subject of the song a tone of challenge uh, coupled with self confidence and of course above all that it had a purpose because it is all about you know the felling of trees and the environmental concern and how the adivasis have always done it and how they have been marginalized their voices have not been heard etc etc so uh this manner of transposing a traditional art form for a cause uh becomes a meaningful uh meaningful act but it also runs the very uh, you know strident risk of uh, appropriation now this is something which i have understood that many a times uh folk art which is otherwise on on the downward curve or is on the you know is in the uh, process of diminishing as such it is suddenly highlighted and it is referred to but the problem that occurs is that your point of beginning or introduction to that art becomes the recreation of it either on screen or you know in its documented form rather than going back to the original so it's like you know uh, i i saw a lot of things there are stage performances of the kind of um, uh, theater that survives in the mithila region which belongs only to women for example women will go we will uh, with their sarees all pulled up you know in a state of gay abandon altogether and uh, they will uh, gather together in a courtyard they will sing they will dance they will impersonate as men and um, this was was for the purpose of propitiating rain so whenever there was insufficient rain or deficient rain they would perform this and somehow it just worked it worked that the following day or so there would be rainfall so whether you call it superstition or whether you call it coincidence but this is a practice which is there which still survives however the problem is that nowhere is either the government or other people making an effort i can't speak of all but largely speaking making an effort to keep that tradition alive of course it has been picked up by researchers and brought to the stage in a very artificial setup where all the women will be wearing the similar sarees which is not so when it is happening in the courtyard of a village where they just come in whatever they have you know in whatever uh, clothing uh, is possible for them there is no um, sync between them you know looking alike or anything of that kind or even the language that is used it is uncensored whereas if it is made into a stage creation then the language becomes different so i have this major problem that if we are speaking about oral traditions and if we want to let them survive how do we do that documentation of course is the ready answer but is that the sole answer should we not you know put in our efforts a little more and keeping the tradition alive in its originary form and that remains a question to battle with now um from here i'll move on to you know mithila art and show you a couple of paintings this was um uh, samira could you just uh, put it up on the screen uh, ma'am jolen has a ppt uh, she'll just be running it jolen okay. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, Is it visible? Yes, yes. Along with this, I want another one in which you can see, you know, or let's let's look at this first. Now, this is a typical scene of Swayamvar, the Patika in which Sita goes. And mind you, uh, this, this is the place of Sita's birth, the Mithila region. She's the daughter of Mithila. So a lot of paintings, um, you know, are devoted to the story of Ram and Sita. However, Ram is not really worshipped because time and again, they have uh, kind of, you know, set him aside as an as uh, a failed husband. He may have been the great ruler and a uh, big success as king, but as a husband, he's a failed husband. So Ram may be worshipped, but not worshipped in that sense. So when it comes to marriages, occasion of marriages, probably they sing songs about Shiv and Parvati because they feel that it's a composite family, etc. The Hindu tradition I'm talking about because this uh, these paintings are largely drawn. Now, in this particular uh, painting, you can see that she is accompanied by her sister as the story goes, and he accompanied by his brother, Lakshman. They meet in a vatika, in a garden. They steal a glance at each other. And as you can see in the stance, in the body bodily stance, it's as if, you know, actually stealing a glance and then making an exit. Now, as compared to this one, when you see, now this was painted by the artist as a part of um, a contest. She painted this using lots of color, uh, all the traditional uh, features that had to be put in. For example, fish. Fish is a very important motif in Mithila paintings. It is considered to be auspicious. Uh, foliage, of course, because the painting demanded that. And the woman who's a bidet with jewelry because she is Sita, she is the daughter of a king, etc. So she painted this as part of a contest in which she was trying, you know, she, and trying for a state award. Later on, years later, she painted the same scene, but with a huge difference. I'd like you to put that up in which, you know, there is a blank between uh, Ram and Sita as they're looking at each other. If you can just put it up. No. Yeah, this one. Uh, the one before this. Yeah. Uh, this is again the same scene, but I really had to ask this question that what about this blank? What does this blank stand for? And the artist, it took it took some time for her to be forthcoming because you know they often feel a little um, hesitant about sharing um, personal experiences. And once they're convinced that you are there for a very uh, you know selfless reason, then they start speaking. So the artist confided, saying that this is actually uh, taking off from a moment in my own life and. When I paint this scene with a blank, I'm actually trying to shun the whole world out of this scene. This gaze, whether you call it the female gaze, I think uh, Shabani is going to talk about the female gaze. Is there a female gaze at all? I'm really excited to hear you. Or whether you call it just a gaze between lovers. But the fact is that nobody else need participate in that. And this is a moment of personal exchange. Uh, now, the reason for painting, this is very untraditional. This is not a traditional form of painting in the sense that the rest of it is, by, as you can see, the border and the intricacies of the drawing. Uh, incidentally, Mithila art is freehand art. There is no scale, no measurement. All of it is freehand. But the artists are so proficient in it that at the end of it, you feel that probably they've used a scale to do the border. And um, uh, she said that, you know, why can't I just keep this moment to myself? I, you know, I would be judging whether I need to go forward with this relationship or not. And this had a huge baggage behind, you know, of marriage as it was decided for the woman rather than the marriage of choice. Um, had it been a marriage of choice, it would have been something like this, where she would have seen someone and chosen herself rather than um, be put in that particular situation where the two must choose each other. So this was one instance which I thought, you know, that the contemporary thought 
because as these artists they are growing in age and as they are being exposed to a lot of things outside um they are also gaining confidence about self expression normally they wouldn't have she wouldn't have spoken about it at all because this would have invited a lot of criticism from the rest of the community that oh my god does she have a background of this kind and so on in the same vein i'd like to compare two other paintings which you have if we can move on it's about you know uh, the circle where there is a woman no uh, this one yes this one Now this one, if you look at it closely, I'm sorry the painting I didn't have a good picture to show the complete uh, frame, but you can very well make out there is a circle within which there is a woman who stands with a plate full of colors in her left hand, and she's painting. Her paintbrush is going beyond that circle. The second woman behind her is probably uh, imitating the same task, and she too has her pen or a paintbrush. which is exceeding the circle within which she stands however around them are other women who are involved in their mundane task of you know daily living daily chores etc only there are three and the third one with a red uh, uh, red uh, arm dupatta or something she too is trying to do the same act because you can see that in the left hand she is holding a bowl of colors the others at the bottom there are just involved in their household chores so i asked her what is the purpose what is the meaning of this uh and they do it for their it's a creative exercise and it is also ritualistic to a great extent because they must decorate their houses and therefore this is just that another one which is uh, a kind of a sequel to it i'll point out the interesting feature of that can we move to the next one no the one another one sorry no yeah this one now here once again you find that there are three there are three women the last one is a young girl and the two women in the front are once again involved in that same creative task with a paint brush the paint brush exceeding the circle which means that you know she and this painting was titled when i got speaking with her we chose the title overreach um of course it was coming from my own understanding as the faustian overreach but um, here yeah, this was uh, she said that well my uh, the 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 artist who was my motivational figure was one whom i wanted to put in the front so assuming she is that the second woman is not in a task of imitation she too is doing her own bit and you can see that her eye is you know it's not as though she is a mere follower she too is doing what she wishes and the third one is an onlooker which is a young girl so i asked her that how have you why have you changed why have you changed almost the same frame into something else and you have just um, uh, erased the other women who were uh, you know who were doing their household chores so we got around talking and finally what the conclusion that we reached was that it is the will of the young girl which is the driving force for this particular painting and the will of the young girl is the girl the young girl is the artist herself as you can see there is a distinct change of skin tone because the others have their faces in white whereas she has a dark skin and she began to talk about you know a long history of how she was discriminated and differentiated in the family in terms of her skin tone and also in terms of gender because she was probably uh, the fourth amongst uh, seven siblings and the last among the daughters a fifth sorry fifth among seven siblings and she said that my mother was proficient in everything she had time for everything she educated us all in this ritual uh, art but when it came to came to answering curious questions which i had in mind she probably did not have the energy to address all of that and by the end of the day she was much too tired and therefore all my questions remained unanswered so there was this compelling desire within me and then of course she reported an instance she said that when the brother got married and the family was going to meet the new uh, the new bhabhi 
brother's wife. Everybody else was taken along except her, uh, largely because of her ordinary looks. So she said, somewhere it had been there at the back of my mind that I have to create a space for myself. I have to carve out my own identity. And if painting be my forte, I would like to do that. And I will go beyond the provisions, as they say, the statute the provisions. I'll go beyond all of that. I will go beyond tradition. And I will do things the way I wish to. So... In that sense, it is her will which is dominating the act of the other two artists who are painting with utmost care and attention. But you would notice that it is very carefully done that they are, you know, they refuse to be circumscribed. And therefore, the paintbrush goes far beyond the circle. So it's like reaching out or creating new identities, creating new spaces. This is something which I found is a growing feature amongst artists today. So by way of either autobiographical art or otherwise, uh, they conform to tradition, but at the same time, they are not willing to just be imprisoned in the web of tradition. They want to pick up themes which interest them and put in their own perception rather than just be guided by the, you know, by the given one. So we have another one, another uh, painting, which was actually done during COVID times, that is last year. Can we see that? This one, yeah. You can see that there is a diagonal intersection, you know, it goes uh, from left to right. And the upper half is about animal kingdom. The lower half is about uh, human beings. And the di difference, of course, is very uh, clear that uh, the anim in the animal kingdom, you can see all of them in twos, in pairs, and all of them in a state of, uh, you know, absolute freedom, liberty, uh, gay abandon, as we say, to use a very cliched phrase. And amongst, uh, in the lower half, where there are men and women, um, of course, she has taken care to put the mask on the faces. And... Uh, human beings are all imprisoned, as you can see, you know, all peeping from behind uh, the windows. And there is a group, a family group, which is walking on the top right, which is walking as if to uh, leave their place of stay to move to a safer destination. So um, I asked her, I said, uh, any particular reason for cutting the frame into half and doing it like this? Or, and why didn't you cut it into two halves as left and right instead of a diagonal. She said, basically, because I want to show that this world is, um, you know, it is uh, somewhere a notch above us because they seem to understand life. They seem to understand the principles of uh, nature and harmony, and they know how to blend things. Whereas we, we have been driven by certain selfish interests where, you know, there is such a cutthroat competition um, amongst people to become something that you're constantly wary of the other one. So there isn't any unity any further. Uh, people uh, just fake uh, friendship, uh, whereas there is no real friendship. And I wanted to show the contrast. Therefore, I have chosen animals as pairs, unlike men and women who may be a few together, but each one is apprehensive of the other. No one is confident of the other. Um, I thought it was a very, you know, um, nice way of interpreting uh, this whole uh, situation where you have been caged, you have been um, marginalized in some sense, marginalized from real active living life. And uh, probably through her painting, she's trying to say that you deserve it because had it not been... Um, for your own uh, tips. A very simple definition, but nevertheless, I found that it was interesting. But um, talking about contemporaneity, yes, a lot of contemporary, a lot of uh, themes are picked up, whether it is uh, female feticide or whether it is... Uh, you know, uh, instances of uh, dowry debts. Um, of course, I would say that dowry debts are not uh, not so 
much heard of today. There was a time where it used to be, but not so much. But uh, female feticide, yes. And uh, she has drawn paintings about those themes as well, moving out of the tradition of all that is harmonious, all that is beautiful, all that shows, you know, a semblance of um, everything in a blended state, etc. So, uh, Doctor, this is sorry to disturb. Your time is almost yeah. up. Yeah, I can see that it's twelve ten. So uh, I'll just uh, wind up by uh, putting in one sentence that, to my mind, a lot of you know, even though it's visual art, but it is arising out of a tradition which is largely oral, in the sense that there is no uh, book that tells you how to paint. You just learn it. It's by way of osmosis that every child learns it and then practices it. So what uh, while orality is often considered a deprived medium because there is no authorship, there is no, uh, you know, it, it denies access to any originary presence, but um, uh, there is, you know, um, there is no authoritative memory, it is preserved in memory, and it's, but the advantage of it being that its structure allows individual interventions. And these individual interventions go on to make, uh, you know, art or any kind of uh, expression very meaningful and interesting. I'll, I'll just uh, stop at that. Thank you, Samira. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Sina has requested that we uh, hold her Q&A session uh, after, right, uh, right now after her talk. So can I please request everyone uh, to either drop their questions in the chat box, uh, the Google Meet chat box, or if you would like to directly ask her a question, please use the raise hand feature on Google Meet and I will uh, uh, you know, give you the space to ask the question, okay? Uh, Ria has already raised her hand. Ria, please go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So, uh, ma'am, you had mentioned at the start that uh, artists do get uh, con just when you try to ask them a little more details about their art. Mm -hmm. So since I'm assuming that you travel to various places for yeah. seeing the tribal art and the tribal regions and talking to the locals. And obviously the tribal community in general are very exclusive. I mean, and they're inclusive of their own. So they do not want to engage mm -hmm. with other people. Mm -hmm. So how do you, and but you're also curious at the same time to know the mechanics or the thought processes or anything about the painting or their lifestyle. So how do you try to manage and, you know, convince them to try and give some or the other information in such a way that they are ensured that it's not to uh, use them or jeopardize them or put them in a vulnerable position? Um, uh, Ria, your question is very pertinent. In fact, I, and I encountered the situation several times. But since my research was spread over a period of almost three years in that region, so I kept visiting and revisiting and met the same people over and over again. Initially, it took some time because they'd ask you very bluntly, what, what is the purpose of your visit? Have you come here to write a book or have you come here to know us and to understand us? So uh, you have to instill that confidence in them that this is not just an act of you know, documentation. It is also arising out of genuine interest about art and gradually they begin to open up. So I, I had some, I mean, we don't have the time today, but maybe another time. Some very, very stark revelations about, you know, women, how they've painted their lives in which they have spoken about persecution at home and how they countered that persecution. Um, uh, to quote one, I would say that there was one particular woman and she's, the interesting part is that she's willing to be named. Although I was hesitant, I said that if I carry this information forward to a different forum, where I would be speaking about you, can I name you? She said, yes, you can. And this was an instance of uh, a woman who had lost her husband, had been handed over to the brother-in-law, and the brother-in-law took uh, advantage of her being. And later on, she went on to become the mother of a child out of this relationship. And she was telling me all about her past life in the pres presence of this young daughter, who's now a grown-up daughter. To which the daughter took great umbrage and she said, why do you keep repeating this tale time and again? Why can't you just keep quiet about it? It was long, long ago. The answer that she gave was hair raising for me. She said, you will not understand. I'm creating witnesses for your legitimacy. 
in this community. And therefore, I feel free and I want to talk about my relationship. So it took a while, but gradually, you know, you have to instill that confidence. Thank you, Anna. Ma'am, there is uh, one uh, question in the chat box. Yeah. Yes, uh, Dania has posted in the chat box. She's asking, how does the insider or outsider dichotomy impact the way we understand traditional visual narratives? Uh, traditional visual narratives, if, if, I, if you allow, I'll give her a written answer to it because I can see that we've already overshot and uh, Shamini is waiting for her uh, turn. So please go ahead. I'll send it to you. And you can take this question. No problem. And you can take this question. Not a problem. Okay. Okay. Can you just repeat it, please? The insider yes. outsider. How does the insider outsider dichotomy impact yeah. the way we understand traditional visual narratives? Okay. Um, you know, um, I wouldn't say that there is a real dichotomy in the first place. Because uh, once you have engaged with this art form and you have studied it, uh, you become a part of it and you understand a lot about its uh, practice, uh, you know, why these paintings are done at, on which occasions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you gain sufficient knowledge about this very form of art and the occasions of practicing this art. But when it comes to the only uh, difficulty that I faced was in the context of biographical art or autobiographical art. It was only in those instances where these people are not willing to uh, talk about it in general to the public. Uh, they, will, uh, they will take time to open up because there are certain quote-unquote secrets of life which are not known to everyone. But gradually, I, I, from what I saw, that as time has passed by, even when it comes to questions of caste, for example, they have begun to acknowledge that, yes, if my caste is different, and caste is a very, you know, it, it exists. Let me tell you, um, let's not uh, disbelieve it or let's not create a utopian situation that caste, it does exist. And it exists very, very stridently. In fact, today itself, I was reading about in Madhubani, how people have fought and five dead over ownership of a pond. Um, so, um, but when it comes to this divide between the so-called upper and the lower strata in terms of caste and class income, I found that um, they have now begun to speak very uh, openly. And for example, a woman belonging to the fisher folk community, she says that you know she uses plenty of fish motif, not only in the traditional way of doing the border or something like that, but even by way of making her woman wear a nose ring, which has a fish motif in that. And she says, this is an identity marker for me. I like to paint this because this is what I belong to. And she had painted her brother's pawn shop on which she had chosen only two or three motifs. No gods, nothing. Yes, there was an image of Buddha because they believed that Buddha had walked that region, not Buddha. And the other was only big, very, uh, you know, uh, what should I say? I mean, you could see it from a distance of 50 meters, big, colorful fish painted on that. And she says, I have done it deliberately. I could have done other things as well, but I do it because I want to establish my identity. There is nothing, there is no shying away from it. Of course, this woman, this particular woman has made it big. In fact, she's the Padma Shri uh, uh, winner this time from Madhubani Art. Her name is Dulari and she has been um, referred to time and again. Does that answer your question somewhat? Ma'am, I think it does. Uh, Ma'am, you can, uh, as uh, Ma'am uh, insisted, perhaps you could take some of the questions and respond to them in the ch chat okay. itself. Okay. And we can uh, move on uh, with the rest of the program. If that's okay. Yeah. Please. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Sinha. Uh, can I now request uh, Ria from the core team again to please introduce our second speaker? Definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Vinita Sinha. 
थैंक यू अब नेक्स्ट वी वेलकम मिस शबानी हसन वालिया शबानी हसन वालिया इज अ राइटर बाय बैकग्राउंड एंड अ फिल्म मेकर बाय प्रोफेशन क्रिएटिंग नॉन फिक्शन कॉन्टेंट इन वेरियस मीडिया इन दू थाउजेंड एंड आई है her work engages with the changing socio political realities volatile subcultures and intimate personal histories in an india in transition as a co-founder of hit and run films she helped build a company that over a decade produced directed and edited feature length documentary works that traveled to national and international festivals and also aired on various channels she also does extensive advocacy work using documentary ethnography observational and long format interview methods to create feature video photography and text pieces in various styles and genres her do- feature documentaries include being bhaijaan 2014 gali 2017 and out of thin air 2009 she is an inlax fellow and worked at the sundance institute los angeles and the documentary filmmakers group london as part of the fellowship She is currently working as an editor in chief in the Third Eye, a feminist think tank on gender, sexuality, technology, and education set up by the Nirantar Trust. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Ria, and thank you, Dr. Vinita. I, it was absolutely a riveting session, and over the years, I have uh, looked at this art, and I have not made the connections that you helped me make today. It was just, it was beautiful. It has changed the way I will look at a painting again. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Maybe we can join together to understand this art more <laughs> later. Yeah, actually, I mean, yes, I was saying that I'll be in touch with you later for something else that yeah, sure, a bulb went off. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, so thank you everyone for inviting me. I mean, my I have to say that my journey of all things trying to look at the world and make sense of the world started at JMC and started at JMC English Literature Department. And I do not get tired of telling people that my life started at first year college in JMC. Everything before that was just a black hole. So <laughs> everything changed after that. So very happy to be here. Okay, so um, this—I mean, I, I don't even know whether this is a lecture. I don't know how to uh, give a lecture. I'm not trained in it. But what I wanted to talk about is um, I've been a practitioner <coughs> as a writer, journalist, and as a filmmaker for over 15 years. And only over the last decade or so, we have had a new and contemporary conversation around women making things uh you know women should be women writers there are women writer film festivals there are women filmmakers who are feted for being filmmakers there are actually funds dedicated to women um and there is and I, and i say this for me and my contemporaries and my colleagues and my peers that we've always had a very fraught relationship with uh tying uh, what we do with our gender uh recently there was a book that came out it's called f rated nandita datta has written that book uh it uh, documents the women filmmakers in bombay cinema uh the famous names are there from uh, farah khan to uh, anjali menon in kerala they are all there and uh um uh, Reema Kakti's interview on that she made honeymoon travels and she's made talash. Uh her Reema Kakti's interview really stands out because it says she also she's also made made in heaven more recently people may know that. Uh stands out because she says uh, I don't want to be known as a feminist. Um uh, and many women filmmakers say that in that book. Now the- i it, it has led and also because of the current work that i'm doing i i'm running this between gender sexuality technology and education i was very curious to actually figure what is it that when women can create or participate in a visual culture say i'm a woman filmmaker or not say i'm a woman filmmaker 
what are the forces at play there and today whatever i'm offering i'm not saying that i have any sense of answer to give i don't uh, this is more uh, an exploration and i'm going to just offer you some trigger points so to speak as to what this history of the gaze has been so to begin with like i'll tell you so um, when i read odyssey i identified with odysseus when i read the beat writers i identified with each of the male protagonists jack kerouac was my favorite for a long long time and in fact when we started making documentary film uh, documentaries a uh, part of our search of characters was actually uh, very kerouac based because we were always what he said chase the mad ones watch them burn and that was our impulse for a really long long time about 5 uh, years into our film making somebody started talking about how the beat writers were so misogynist and so on and it really confused us and me and my co-director we are both women and because we both loved kerouac equally equally and then we realized oh i see oh okay okay it's the women characters they are talking about but just like kerouac wanted you to believe we never noticed the women characters because we were so busy being seduced by the male character in uh the books now which then brings me to exactly what the male gaze is the male gaze is um and and we have to talk about the male gaze before we come to the female gaze because the male gaze was articulated first um it has the male gaze is the predominant way of looking at the world and if you're a student of visual culture or if you're in and i feel we are all students of visual culture because we now live in a heavily visual culture because of social media then it will be very hard for us to not recognize in what way and in what visual ways we are framing ourselves so i'm just going to i just share screen from here right uh, yes you can share your screen or you uh, we also have dolan on standby he has the ppt downloaded so if you want you can also download it Yeah, yeah. If Jolene can just share it, I'll just tell it to you. Jolene, can you share your screen, please? Yes, please. Ah, uh, can you see it? Is it visible? Yeah, one second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, visible. so uh before we get to the female gaze i'll uh before we get to the male gaze i'll just tell you that the female gaze is a feminist film theoretical term so it's been uh the term emerges from feminist film theory and it only exists because there was a person a film theorist called laura malvi who coined the term the male gaze so the feminist film theorists reacted to the male gaze to coin the female gaze i'm just giving you a history of even how the term comes up so the male gaze is the gaze which represents not only the gaze of a heterosexual male viewer but also the gaze of the male character and the male creator of the film um and i just wanted to read out this quote which is the laura malvi quote which is that which sort of gives you an idea on how the world is organized and once we get into it you will see how visual culture is actually organized according to a lot of these rules so in a world ordered by sexual imbalance pleasure in looking has been split between the active male and the passive female the determining male gaze projects its fantasy onto the female form which is styled accordingly in the traditional exhibitionist role women are simultaneously looked at and displayed with their appearance coded for strong visual and erotic impact so they can be said to connect connotes to or what they call a to be looked at ness now before laura malvi said all of this um i mean the i mean she owes a lot of her history to, to one of my my favorite all time writers which is john berger 
who has written um, ways of seeing um and ways of seeing is essentially um it owes its roots to uh, uh, psychoanalysis it owes its roots to anthropology as in what we frame what we shoot and who we looked at who we look at and who is looking and as we go forward hopefully you'll be making the connection as who is doing the looking and who is constantly being looked at so in feminist theory the male gaze is the act of depicting women and the world in the visual arts and literature from a masculine heterosexual perspective that presents and represents women as sexual objects for the pleasure of the heterosexual male viewer it's a term coined by feminists in response to the claims made by malvi that the conventions established in classical hollywood films required all spectators regardless of their sex to identify with the male protagonist and to adopt the controlling male gaze around which such films were held to be structured so i would like you to all to just sort of remember the fact this the idea that who do you identify with and how is it that we all identified with the hero in kerouac's novels the it's because of how that world is structured the female gaze thus marked out neglected territory for many the term alludes to the right of women to adopt the active and objectifying gaze that has traditionally and stereotypically been associated with males could you move to the next slide please So Laura Marie owes her thing to John Berger. Now John Berger actually is the one who invented the idea of the gaze, the looking. According to usage and conventions which are at last being questioned but have by no means is overcome, the social presence of a woman is different in kind from that the time I mean, which is advertised of a man. and by this he he has mapped all visual culture by using which is media film and of course western classical art um a man's presence is dependent upon the promise of power which he embodies if the promise is large this of how is the framed every man is framed to a power and sexual but its object exterior is always the man a man's presence suggests that he is capable of doing to you or for you now think of amitabh bachchan and the utilitarian aspect of his power in fact the angry young, young man trope which is definitely like another lecture by itself is the why the angry young man was used as a nation building exercise actually was because that anger helped in sort of challenge corruption which was stopping the nation's progress um could you move to the next slide please by contrast and again this now think of any visual that comes to mind a woman's presence expresses her own attitude to herself and defines what can and cannot be done to her a man does and a woman receives um go on next slide please so one might simplify this by saying men act and women appear men look at women women watch themselves being looked at this did, i mean you you can even put if you look at even wonder woman which is seen as a feminist superhero film even wonder woman fits in, into this gaze pattern um this determines not only most relations between men and women but also the relation of women to themselves the surveyor of a woman in herself is male so what are we saying that even when a woman looks at herself she is looking through her to at herself through a man's eyes 
and the surveyed is always female and thus she turns herself into an object and most particularly an object of vision a sight and now i'm saying even like you know if you can think of film reviews or art reviews where we say a sight for sore eyes like even let's say the so what does a sight for sore eyes mean it's always associated in objectifying a certain um, image of somebody that is providing you pleasure uh next slide please. so um let's say if we are looking at the classical painting tradition uh the renaissance painting tradition so um bajal i mean i'm literally giving you an introduction to bajal but we i highly recommend him uh so he he talks a lot about how we frame women protagonists in visual culture a woman is always known by her gestures i mean she's always shown i mean and i'm saying documentary after documentary has at least one scene of a woman looking into a mirror and combing her hair or putting kajal in her eyes there's always a scene of a woman looking at herself in the mirror and the most iconic male scene of looking himself in a mirror is taxi driver al pacino um, i don't know how many have seen that and but when a man looks at himself in a mirror he is not looking at himself as an object but when a woman looks at herself in a mirror every gesture of hers uh, moves towards a larger kind of a narrative that actually if you pull back is that every gesture of hers is predetermined for a male viewer so everything a woman does in cinema media film she does because of how she keeping in mind how she appears to others and in all probabilities that other is a heterosexual male viewer and i am complicating this argument by saying that we are women who carry the gaze of a heterosexual male viewer when we consume images um there are there are disruptions in this kind of methodology and we'll come to that uh, uh could you go to the next so the classical male portrait so a man's presence suggests what he's capable of doing to you or for you next please so uh this is malvi depicting almost every film ever made the film opens with the woman as object of the combined gaze of the spectator and all the male protagonists in the film she is isolated glamorous on display sexualized but as the narrative progresses she falls in love with the main male protagonist and becomes his property losing her outward glamorous characteristics her generalized sexuality her showgirl connotations her eroticism is subjected to the male star alone by means of identification with him through participating in his power the spectator also can indirectly possess her too when this storyline is broken which is when she doesn't fall in love with the man let's say or she wants to do her own thing invariably um, and there's large cinematic history and theory and study around it she is punished in the cinematic universe either she dies or she goes mad or something or the other in all or she's murdered or something like that when she traverses this line where she where the female the the female character visual or whatever it is is not possessed by the male or the spectator she is punished by visual culture storylines these are the stories that we all imbibe subconsciously and i think what i am trying to talk about here is these things came to us even as women film makers very very late in life it's not something that's easy to see through uh because we haven't had an opportunity to develop a cinematic gaze and by we i mean women uh women started making films very 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 late 
they were not given cameras till about 20 years ago uh by the, when my contemporaries went to bombay and were training as cinematographers my female friends um invariably male cinematographers would tell them that the camera is too heavy and it's too big that how will you carry it and honestly the cameras were really heavy and very big because the camera industry never took into account that a female shape of a shoulder should be carrying the uh, thing the camera as a machine was designed for a male shoulder so the the obviously the i mean if you go through what the what the visual is producing and what produces these images there is a huge kind of a what you call a natural kind of a connection like i'll give you one more trivia when the new when the digital video cameras first came into india these were called the sony pd150s um uh, it changed our lives because they were light so for the first time women could start shooting on their own um and uh, uh we realized that but there was some problem with the exposure and we had to always over expose for slightly darker skins and then we all started researching researching and at some point um america started coming out with studies that the sony camera hadn't taken into account dark skin before deciding before making its first round of lensing it had automatically assumed that the people in front of the camera would be fair skinned characters and hence the exposure used to screw up with dark skin thing we used to do extra lighting and so on and so forth 20 years after those cameras sony apologized for that kind of a lensing thing so when when i say female gaze i don't just actually mean gender i mean there is a gaze that is when we say heterosexual male i will say it's heterosexual white male that's the gaze of the world that's the gaze of the visual world that we inhabit could you go to the uh, next slide please okay now before we go to farah khan um i i just wanted to bring this back to like our film journey my film journey my contemporary film journey um uh, that you know me and many of my contemporaries we were told that we were like boys when we were growing up like i was always told i was like a boy my father called me son and so on and so forth which gave me immense license and i got away with a lot right because boys had certain kind of mobility which girls didn't and so on and so forth uh growing up in the 90s we also saw it as a compliment and so on and i feel that that we internalized that we internalized i think there was a gender discourse that we internalized that said that by imitating men we may buy ourselves certain kind of liberation um i do think that is it has in, um, informed a large part of gender discourse but uh in keeping with uh visual culture again it did inform what they call the indian female gaze which was first seen with this film which is farah khan's undressing of shahrukh khan in om shanti om i don't know how many of you have seen the film but when this uh uh when this uh, film came out it caused a huge kind of a like a sort of a dance of victory for girls and uh women because it was like uh what men had done to women all throughout cinematic history here was a female director who had done to shahrukh khan he had come out slow motion water dripping off his chest all of that like he there, there was an ob- sexual objectification of his body that um that really sort of got women to say that okay maybe maybe this is what the female gaze is it's when men are objectified exactly the way women are could you go to the next please 
Um, Alankrita Srivastava's lipstick under my burqa also. Uh, it was seen as a victory for women. A large part was because the censor board said that uh, we must censor certain scenes because the film is very lady oriented. Um, and uh, the reason was that a lot of women were doing what men do, which is they were having sex and they were, well, whatever you've seen men do, women were doing in this and there was desire. So this was maybe this was a female gaze. Could we have the next? Yeah. Bombay Bagels, which is the most contemporary Alankrita Srivastava thing. Please, I, like I've, I've chosen this still because I think there's a conscious thing of they have framed Pooja as, as a classical artwork painting as position of power. Usually in traditional family photographs, actually, for example, uh, women would be sitting like this, but there would be a man standing next to her with a hand on her shoulder. That was the traditional rich family photograph. What she's, Alankrita has done is she has removed the man and she has put Pooja Bhatt as Pooja Bhatt as the woman and she has kept the power imagery intact with just the woman. There are people now debating, is this the female gaze by converting, by switching the power? Um, I actually, uh, sorry, one more. Could we have one more, please? There's one more, I think, photograph after this. Yeah. Zoya Akhtar, who is an interesting filmmaker by all measures, uh, she, uh, when she, she broke into the scene, a lot of people consider Zoya's work uh, pushing the gender agenda, so to speak. Uh, Zindagi Na Milegi Dubara was a block blockbuster, which everybody said is again a win for women and maybe women making mainstream films with superstars. And uh, here again, Hrithik Roshan is the one who sexualized and none of the female actors are se sexualized. People said that maybe this is the female gaze. Now, I actually wanted to sort of complicate this idea. Yes, this could be the female gaze, but I wanted to actually just stop and ask that, is this what the female gaze is? Because if you look at what Farah Khan does, is she directly inverts the misogyny of using the body as a spectacle and she places the body, she just replaces the female body with the male body. I am not entirely sure if that's the function of the female gaze or if that is the female gaze. Is the female gaze the exact opposite of the male gaze? I think is the question I'm asking. Zoya Akhtar's films subscribe to a capitalist notion of power, which is money. And I do feel that her cinema limits her arguments to the success economy, a market economy, even rock on. Uh, it's like if you have success in this globalized capitalist sense, then, you know, then it's okay if, if men are sexualized and women are not, but the capitalist structure that she celebrates is such a male structure, so I'm not entirely sure if it is the female gaze. And Alankrita's films have a lot of critique anyway, but um, there is, I mean, there's a, a lot of, I mean, Alankrita films makes a lot of theorists very uncomfortable because she does a paint by numbers kind of a thing. It's a tick, tick mark, tick mark, tick mark kind of a thing, which may be an important first step. But again, I think it's, it, it's just, I'm just leaving the question open is that, is that a female gaze? And just as something to counter is um, like, is a question that I've asked myself and my peers ask themselves all the time, is that does the female gaze ape the male gaze in terms of power consolidation? Where does it continue to rest power? And I think a useful question to ask women who are making culture, especially visual culture, is to ask ourselves is what norms have we internalized? 
um i wanted to just play a clip um if you could go to the next slide yeah thank you if you could play from time code 158 please so this is a film we have made it's called being bhaijaan uh it's a documentary on salman khan's fans actually and it was a sort of uh, so we heard a story we heard a story that uh, when wanted came out uh, scores of men would go watch salman khan's films in single screen theaters and take off their shirt when salman khan took off his shirt so samreen and i we were very curious we wanted to know why the, why why are men taking off their shirts and we also wanted to participate in that fest so uh we made this feature documentary which was a huge huge eye opener for us and um i'm just going to play a scene because this is two women filmmakers shooting a salman khan look alike so salman khan being the icon of masculinity in all kinds of ways and uh after that like i just wanted to say something so yeah thanks um also just to remind us sorry that uh, we are almost at the end of our time limit okay okay sir uh also uh, jolan we can't hear anything i think you'll have to stop sharing and share the video as a tab okay ma'am should i check it on youtube is it on Wait, no just stop sharing and open the vimeo video as a tab share tab which is fine you can hear it i can hear it you know i'll tell you if it's a problem we'll just carry on i'll just close it with the thing it's fine um uh, we do that we can, yeah actually jo you can also whatsapp me the link let me try side by side in the meantime uh, mr sasan walia can end and if we manage to play it we can play yeah. it yeah yeah So actually this clip is uh, we were shooting with uh, Shan who's our protagonist who's the Salman Khan look like in a gym and these are two women shooting him in a gym and while making of this film we realized that actually Farah Khan's argument that I'm framing this male figure the way women have been framed is actually an absolute flawed argument because Salman Khan and Shan and this whole culture of men displaying themselves is they are not displaying themselves for women they're displaying themselves for other men it's a dialogue between men and not women and hence the idea that this could be a female gaze falls absolutely flat it's it's again a culture that is facilitating men consolidating power it's just that in today's time for various kinds of reasons which we don't have time to get into the power consolidation is happening over a man's body which is often naked so to just close with i feel that um the question of female gaze may be the flawed question and i think what we need to move to just like the framing of the male gaze i feel is a flawed framing i think what we have is a patriarchal gaze and i think what we need to move towards is a feminist gaze and a feminist gaze that is sympathetic to which doesn't just inverse the 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 spectacle creation which they have done with women queer people people of color minorities but it actually moves towards creating a a visual culture that recognizes that each story comes from its own lived reality and each deserves its place in the center all right thank you I had so much other to do. Can I just send it to you later? You can share it with the. Absolutely, actually, we can. You can send. Okay. Thank you all.
Thank you so much. Can I please request the audience to uh, drop any questions that they have in the chat box or raise their hands if they would like to directly ask the question uh, to uh, Ms. Satanwalia. Uh, okay, let me just read out Vanilla's question and we will come to you. Uh, Vanilla asks, as a filmmaker, what are the strategies that you use to implement or cultivate the female gaze? If any, as per your answer. Yeah, so um, as I was saying that I, I think it's taken us a time to even realize that it's not the female gaze that we need to cultivate, that it's the feminist gaze. And I think that that is maybe a just that. It's just if we use that as a central strategy over the next 50 years, we may be able to create a new kind of a visual vocabulary to replace the last 1000 years that constantly put margins at the center, margins at the center. And gender is just one way of looking at that. Uh, they are, as filmmakers, male, female, queer, I feel all of us have a sort of a decolonize, like a responsibility to decolonize our minds, so to speak. I hope I know it's a vague thing to say, but ma'am, my question was quite similar on the lines of vanilla. So I think ma'am answered my queries as well. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Can we have more questions in the chat, if any? Uh in the meantime, I thought, yeah, Sandhya, go ahead. Uh, no, Samir, if you had a question, uh, go ahead. I'll I'll go no, after. No, you. I can ask you, that's okay. You can ask her. Um, right. Uh, thank you, Shabani, um, for that wonderful talk. Um, it was, it was, I mean, this is something that's really um, been something that I've been thinking about all of last year because I was stuck in the pandemic with another filmmaker friend and we actually um, wanted to, we, we started writing the screenplay for a Malayalam feature film and which was, which would be a feminist film. And um, thinking about all, all of the ways in which we could break that, uh, the gaze of the camera, which is the masculine um, gaze and all the kinds of traditional camera angles, especially when it comes to showing any kind of affection or, or portraying a certain kind of emotion, uh, which is not uh, to be, uh, especially intimacy, let's say, let's just put, put it that way. Um, because intimacy is not something that is very well um, captured by the masculine camera, right? I mean, it is it is it is something that is that is shot from above. It it objectifies especially the body of the woman, and it it's ultimately not intimacy that is portrayed, but but something else. So we have been thinking about what kind of even even lighting, even even. I mean, apart from the angles and the lighting and the, the kind of storyline that we want to bring forth, it is a feminist uh, story um, and the kind of, um, you know, the writing that goes into that. We've been really flummoxed by that. Um, and it is not something that has ever been done. And although Malayalam film is actually making great strides, yeah, much, much, uh, than I mean, much, much more than uh, Bollywood or any other kind of regional cinema at the moment, I think. Um, even then, I mean, we don't, even, even with all the women directors that we have at the moment, it's still not able to portray, uh, the woman, uh, the subjectivity of the woman, um, in any kind of, uh, deeper sense, I, we, we felt. Um, so just wanted to have your thoughts on that and how to kind of, no, maybe this, is such a, it, this is such a critical and urgent thing. It's because the subjectivity of the woman or the subjectivity of the self outside of our patriarchal upbringing is so alien to us. Yeah. We don't, we don't know it. So how are we going to put it on screen? Yeah. We have, we have understood power exactly the way men have understood power because there was only one way of understanding power. And hence we understood victimhood exactly the way society understands victimhood. Yeah. So no, I, I'm not saying that I have any answers for it. I can just give you a couple of examples where I feel it's worked. The new film Nomadland, if you have seen, Chloe Zhao's film. Okay. 
uh it's nominated for the oscar but i find chloe's work very very interesting um it's very disturbing but it's a really new vocabulary it's a new emotional vocabulary i was also i mean we also really liked the way uh portrait of a lady on fire was shot uh, exactly. i haven't seen i haven't seen uh, that that was also quite beautiful yeah, yeah. So I think Nomad Land is a great one, and in Indian filmmakers, actually, I feel someone who has done something I find interesting is Konkana's Death in the Boonj, because yeah. I feel she ended up writing a very interesting male character, and um, I don't think a male director could have written that male character. Hmm. And uh, and you know, we assume that the female gaze is how the woman is in the film, but I don't think that's necessary. The 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 family setup. and who's weak in that family and who's strong yeah. uh, i feel that sensitive sensitivity to pick that texture up was very female and feminine yeah and despite like wh- how the ending was or maybe because of the end it so i think konkana is actually on to something like i look mm-hmm. forward to her you know, work the ending was also pretty symbolic right yeah, it is. yeah 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 because i mean it's actually it's the story of a man who can't survive this kind of a family right yeah. i mean the, the indian family which has a certain idea of success and certain idea of whatever and he can't because for gender reasons for sexuality reasons yeah. so now i mean in india i think we also like the work of avinash arun uh, who is made killa yeah, yeah. killa is very nice yeah killa is very good yeah. yeah and i really like neeraj bhavan i like mm-hmm. masan a lot yeah yeah I think Masan also because it's a, there's a tenderness to it. There is a I mean I, again like I, I'm very wary of always associating these emotions to fem- women filmmakers or to feminine way of thinking. But there is something about Masan that keeps in mind that that, that sort of breaks this uh, top down view of the world, yeah. which That's is true. yeah. yeah. So I, yeah. it's a it's a it i feel it's a process and it's a journey and one may not get it right in the first film and maybe in the fifth film <laughs> it's an important process to be on yeah we just kind of paralyzed at the moment because it's we've taken on so much it's very ambitious but yeah let's see oh good luck good luck thank you <laughs> i think uh, unfortunately we're out of time but uh, from the comments and the chat box uh, it is evident that uh, both Uh, sessions have been hugely popular with our audience i am so sorry jolan i uh, if there are any other questions if uh, ms asanwali is okay we can maybe pass them on to her at a later point of time sure, sure. anytime anytime sure. and we'll also be eager to uh, take on any resource material that you said you'd share with us we we'll definitely pass it on to our uh, to the students uh, can i please uh, request uh, danya the enda president to uh, give the vote of thanks thank you oh, ma'am this the certificate all very stressed about it kashish who's asked hi highly stressed yeah thank you yes ma'am uh, on behalf of the english literary association department of english jc and medical college i would like to thank both our esteemed speakers dr vinita sinha and ms shabani hasanwalia for dedicating their time and energy into making this such an intellectually stimulating session uh, we are also grateful to our principal dr sandra joseph ma'am for lending her support and encouragement to this endeavor furthermore we would like to thank sister dr rosely for her blessings the organization of this lecture series would not have been possible without the efforts of our teacher in charge tolly kapoor ma'am faculty members in the department jennifer ma'am and sandhya ma'am as well as our ela staff advisor samira ma'am and anisha ma'am thank you to you all next we would like to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of the it department of jmc especially gaurav sir whose expertise made today logistically seamless uh, again this word of thanks would be incomplete without giving special commendation to our ela core team who worked tirelessly on different duties to make the lecture series successful a round of applause for you all as well Finally we would like to end by expressing our gratitude to the entire department of english the teachers and the students as well as our engaged audience for joining in this virtual session and making it interactive thank you once again for every to everyone for today we hope to organize more such events in the future to keep academic conversations flowing 
good afternoon and have a good day thank you everyone thank you so much for joining thank in. you thank you ma'am thank you thank you bye everyone to start uh, leaving the meet thank you so much all right thank you so much bye everyone